All right, Isaiah 29. We'll have probably we'll finish Isaiah 29 next week, and then uh, the following Wednesday we'll probably have a Chris, couple, probably one Wednesday of a Christmas message. Then the following week uh, is the Christmas Eve service will be a Thursday, um, but we'll probably do a couple Sundays of Christmas messages. But uh, this this coming Sunday I'm going to finish the increase series. We'll do our last uh, instance in Scripture of what we're told to increase, uh, and. Uh, and then we'll also finish our series on the bodily resurrections found in Scripture on Sunday night, and then we'll get into some Christmas stuff after that. Great time of year to look at the birth of Christ. Isaiah 29. Get to the text in a moment, but by way of introduction, talking about hiding tonight. Scripture talks about those who hide from the Lord. Uh, there are many who have come up with clever hiding places throughout history, uh, there, you know, and I'm not going to run down. I, I, I looked for a list of funny things or cute things, places where people have hid. All I could come up with was suggestions for where to hide your cash or valuables in the house. I, I clicked like the third page of Google and I, I was looking for more of, you know, World War II, Europe, uh, and the Nazis want to kill Jews, but there's those courageous Oscar Schindlers who are risking their lives to hide Jews. And so what are some of the clever spots they found to hide them? Or... There's slavery, and the, but there's the Underground Railroad, Harriet Tubman, and there's uh, people that are hiding, uh, hiding people that have been treated as property and hiding them from being caught and whipped or killed or, or lynched or dragged back. And so where, you know, where have they hid? Uh, you think of criminals and convicts and prison escapees, and uh, they have found some clever hiding places while they're on the lam and running from authorities and avoiding Capture, think of all the places somebody can wedge themselves down into or all the ways that uh, somebody could contort themselves. Uh, it's really a mind game. Hiding is a mind game. Even if you play hide and seek, it's a mind game. You are getting into uh, the mind of the search party and you're thinking, where would they look? Where, if, wherever they would look, I won't go there. Where would they not look? Where would they not think of that's where I'll go? You're playing that mind game. You're getting in their head and guessing and could be because you don't want to be found. You want to be undetected. And in this passage here, Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah, the Lord calls out those who try to hide from him. You, know, you can hide from a little kid who's looking for you in the house under a laundry basket. But Isaiah really confronts those who are actually trying to hide from God, which is laughable. <laughs> and we'll, we'll uh, get, get to that in a moment. Isaiah 29 we left off last time in verse 14. We'll read verses 15 through 19 in Isaiah 29. Verse 15, woe unto them that seek deep, here it is, to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark, and they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? They're hiding from God in the dark and saying, he doesn't see. It's dark, so he doesn't see. <laughs> it's insane. Uh, verse 16, surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? It is not yet a very, is it not yet a very little while? And Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. And in that day, Shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So this is talking about hiding there in verse 15. Woe unto them that hide their counsel from the Lord. They hide it in darkness. Hiding is stressful. Uh, it's not all that stressful when you're playing hide and seek because nothing is at stake. But even, even if you're just playing hide and seek and the person who's looking for you is very close, you know, they're going to hear your heart beating a little bit. There's something nerve wracking about hiding. There's nervousness. Hiding produces paranoia. Hiding produces nervousness. Hiding produces some panic, especially when there is something at stake, especially if it's uh, your own safety, your own uh, protection that is at stake. What a terrible way to live, always hiding. 
always looking over your shoulder. Uh, you know, these, these uh, criminals often, these, prison, these prisoners who escape, often they, they're the ones who end up turning themselves in because the burden of hiding was greater than the burdens of prison. And you think, boy, prison sounds rough, getting beat up and all these things and no liberty and, and just all of the things to fear in prison. Often they'd rather have that than the fear, the, the nervousness, the panic, the paranoia of, of everywhere you go, you're looking over your shoulder. You know, at night, every, every sound that's made, could that be them? You know, are they, have they finally got me? Um, always having to plan an exit strategy. You know, every building you're in, all right, if they come in, what's my, what am, how am I going to maneuver? What's my quickest way out? That's no way to live. And so often they say, you know what? I would rather just go to jail and sleep with them <laughs> and, and, just turn, and just be done with it and serve the sentence. And I understand that hiding is no way to live, especially hiding from the Lord, hiding from God. And that's exactly what Isaiah uh, is accusing his hearers of doing here. Why? Why would anyone hide from the Lord? What is it that they're so afraid of? What, what is it that they're so averse to? What is it that they're resisting? And so I want to answer that question tonight. Our title is, Why Men Hide from God. Why Men Hide from God. Number one, and the points kind of all have a, a sub point along with it. It's maybe a little bit of a mouthful for each one if you're in the habit of keeping an outline. But number one, they hide from his view. They hide from his view. Why? Because of their guilt. They hide from his view because of their guilt. Verse 15, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? If we just cover our act with darkness, God, who sees us? God doesn't. Who knows what we're doing? God doesn't because it's dark. He can't see. We'll, we won't do it in the day. We'll wait till night and then God won't know. He won't see us. It's natural for all wrongdoers to want to keep their wrongdoing secret. Wrongdoers of any kind, you go down to your, your first grade classroom, wrongdoers of any kind don't want to be discovered. Why? If, they're, if they do it in the light and it's known and they're discovered, there will be consequences. And, and often one of the consequences is having to stop doing what they're doing. And so no one wants to be detected. No one wants to be discovered. They want to hide. That way they can continue in their sin. That way they don't have to have consequences. They don't have to cease from that particular area of sin or transgression for, for a time. John 3, 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Who is light? Jesus. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. They hate the light. The, the light ruins their chance to keep doing evil. They don't want to be reproved. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to be confronted. They don't want consequences. And so they hate the light and don't come to the light. Part of the deceitfulness of sin is overconfidence that the sinner is going to get away with it. That, that's how deceitful sin is, is when we get our hearts set on sin, we manage to convince ourselves irrationally that nobody's going to know. And we think very little of everybody else's powers of observation. <laughs> and we, we overinflate our, our own cleverness. And we really think we'll get away. We think nobody knows. We think it's the perfect crime. Uh, this is a tendency of man that God tells us about uh, in his word. Job 24, 15. This, it's, it's amazing to me how these other, how these other verses that I'm going to read tie in perfectly with Isaiah 29 and verse 15. The, to be under the impression that you can hide from God, that he won't see what you're doing, that, that is part of the, as silly as it sounds, that is how much sin distorts our thinking. That is how unreasonable our minds are when they're taken over by sin. And so it's, you read verse 15 and say, how can you be, how can you think that? There's other places in scripture where God says they thought that. <laughs> because we read that and go, that's not realistic. Nobody thinks that. God says people think that. They really do. Job 24, 15, the eye also of the adulterer waiteth for the twilight, saying, no eye shall see me. The adulterer waits until it's twilight, waits until the peak of the day has gone away, saying, this way no eye shall see me. Now that's talking about men, but there are others that say, God won't even see me. Psalm 94, 7, they, speaking of wrongdoers, evildoers, it says, Psalm 94, 7, yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. 
they actually say, the Lord shall not see. Ezekiel 8, 12. Then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 9, 9. Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, the Lord seeth not. He doesn't see us. The, that principle that's there, that sinners incorrectly believe they can hide their sin from the Lord, that is established immediately in Scripture. The moment you find sin in the Bible, you find hiding immediately thereafter. Adam falls into sin in Genesis 3.6. He's hiding from the Lord by Genesis 3.8. <laughs> two, two verses later, he's already under the impression that he can hide from the Lord. The first instinct from the guilt of sin is to hide the guilt of sin. They, they hide from the Lord's view because of their guilt. And, 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 and so these folks that Isaiah is addressing are just doing what their father Adam did. They're just doing what we did as children. They're just doing what's in our hearts. When did Adam hide from the Lord? When he didn't have a sufficient covering for his sin. Remember, he sinned and understood his guilt, and his best covering, his best what he could make, was inadequate. It was an apron of figs, and he still hid. It wasn't until he received the covering that God made for him, through death, through the shedding of blood, and when he received the right covering, a sufficient covering that God made, that represented God's righteousness and not his, we're never told that he hid from the Lord ever again. He didn't have to. He was in God's righteousness and no longer in his righteousness. Uh, even the unsaved religious person uh, with good works, supposedly, is still in their own righteousness. And that's equivalent to wearing their own apron of figs. It's the best that they can do. And it's, it's woefully inadequate, and they still end up hiding from the presence of the Lord. That's precisely what we have, what Adam had, the righteousness of God. And the beauty of this is this. What, what's the opposite of hiding? It's to be found. You know, you're hidden or you're found. And Philippians 3.9 says that we can be found in him, not to be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's a direct correlation to Genesis 3, that when Adam was in his own righteousness, he, he didn't want to be found. He was hid. But when he had God's sacrifice, he was found in him, not having his own righteousness, but, but God's righteousness, with the righteousness which is of God. Those who don't have that righteousness hide their guilt from God. But does that work? Can you hide from the Lord? There's an old phrase, you can run, but you can't hide. I was curious where that phrase came from. I looked it up. I thought I thought I was going to find some like mid medieval philosopher or like Thomas Hobbes or some real scholarly thing. You know where that phrase comes from? You can run, but you can't hide. The boxer, Joe Lewis <laughs> in the 1940s. That thing, his, he said to his opponent, you can run, but you can't hide. The truth is, though, that you can neither run nor hide from God. You can't do either one. Well, can't you run? No. Psalm 139 says, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You can't run. You can't flee because God is omnipresent. He, God is a spirit. He sees all. He's everywhere at once. And he says so in Psalm 139. You can't run from him. Jonah tried. He failed. You couldn't run. Let me get so far away that God won't see, that God won't be there. Can't do it. This is God's universe. He is everywhere. Okay, so you definitely can't run. But can, but, but can you hide? What does the scripture say about that? Job 34, 22. And, and again, make note that in Isaiah 29, it's darkness that they're using to hide. If we just turn all the lights off and make it pitch black, God won't see. Listen to how the Lord responds to that elsewhere in his word. Job 34, 22. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Job 34, 22, compared with Isaiah 24, 15, it's just incredible, I think. There is no kind of darkness where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. In Psalm 139, 12. And so Psalm 139, 7 and 8, I just read it debunks. Uh, it, it, it postulates God is omnipresent. And then Psalm 100, a few verses later, 
Uh, it does the same thing here uh, with regard to darkness and light. Psalm 139, 12, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. The psalmist says the darkness and the light are both alike to God. So those who think, ooh, dark is different from light, God will see me if it's known and exposed in the light, but if it's dark and black, God won't see. No, the psalmist takes care of that right there and says, no, to God, darkness and, and light are both alike. He's the one that thought of light. He can see right through darkness. Darkness is no problem for him to see right through. There's a million verses we could quote, not a million, but several. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro the whole earth, beholding the evil and the good. Um, all things are open and naked under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We could go on. He sees everything. We understand that. The man who thinks that he can hide from God, the man who thinks that he can hide from God has convinced himself that he knows something God doesn't know, namely his location. How full of yourself do you have to be? I know so. I have a piece of information. I have a piece of knowledge that the creator of the universe does not happen to have. Wow. <laughs> that is to assert one's intellectual superiority to God. But can a God exist who is intellectually inferior to his creatures? If you have a God who is intellectually inferior to his creatures, you don't have a God. <laughs> You've got something else. <laughs> if you say there is a God, but he is ignorant. If I have information that God doesn't have, then God is ignorant of the information I have. And so if you say there is a God, but he's, he is ignorant, <laughs> he knows less than you do, then you don't have a God. Then, you, well, well, there's a God. He's just not omniscient and he's not omnipresent. Okay, so he's limited and finite and ignorant and inferior and not separate from his creation and flawed and no different from me or you. All right, now you don't have just bad theology. Now you have atheism. Now you have no God. Because if... If he's just like us, <laughs> then, you, then there is no God. We're not God. And so if that's your God, you don't believe in God. The beautiful thing, though, is that while you most certainly cannot hide from God, you can hide in God. And he tells us that in his word, Psalm 17, 8, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Sometimes you just need to be alone with God and hidden from the world. Sometimes you just need to be undisturbed by everything else that will bring you down. And you just need to get in the presence of God and not be anywhere else but there, but under the shadow of his wings. Psalm 27, 5, for in time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. That's the kind of hiding place that's good. <laughs> in his pavilion in the time of trouble. And then in the New Testament as well, we're told in Colossians 3 that it doesn't start out on a very flowery Lovely note, ye are dead. <laughs> For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead. Yourself, you, you, crucified with him, Galatians 2. But you're alive unto God through Christ, and your life, you and what you want, your opinions and your whims and your will, that's crucified, that's dead. It's hid. Because you're hid with Christ in God. And so it is good to be hid in him. Not from him, but in him. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. What a beautiful way to state these principles. So that's number one. They hide from his view because of their guilt. Number two, they hide from his design. They hide from his design because of their rebellion. They hide from his view because of their guilt, but they hide from his design because of their rebellion. Verse 16. Surely you're turning of things upside down. Hold on, what's that all about? How had Isaiah's audience turned things upside down? Well, if you think you have knowledge that the creator doesn't have, <laughs> that's upside down. The truth is that the creator has knowledge that you lack. The creator has knowledge that you don't have. But, but if you're going to insist that you have knowledge that he doesn't have, you've turned the truth upside down. You're, li you're living in a, in a funny, bizarro world that's turned upside down. That isn't, isn't, doesn't correspond to truth. But the truth, Isaiah says here in verse 16, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Uh, Isaiah says, 
you're just clay. That's all you are. You're just clay in the potter's hand. This is the first time that Isaiah uses that analogy. He'll use it two more times in his prophecy. Uh, it's found also in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 18, the Lord... Jeremiah is all about object lessons. If you're the kind of person that likes to learn, you like when the preacher brings some trunk of things up and has some, here's my show and tell. And sometimes visuals last in our memory longer. And, uh, you know, you like comedians that bring a whole bunch of junk up there, you know, that your, your prophet is, is Jeremiah. Because throughout the book of Jeremiah, God keeps telling him to go grab stuff. <laughs> Jeremiah, go grab this and go to the people. And, and, and there's a lot of very powerful preaching that can be done in those passages. One of them, one of the object lessons that God gives Jeremiah says, hey, Jeremiah, you're going to take a field trip. I want you to go down to the potter's house. I mean, literally, not, not just like visualize a potter. Jer God told Jeremiah, you find a potter. You find somebody whose business is pottery, and you go to their house and watch them work. Go. And so Jeremiah goes to a potter's house, and he watches a potter work, and he sees uh, clay in the hands of the potter, and that that piece of clay is marred. It's mangled. It's misshapen. It's, it's messed up. And the Bible says that that potter made it again. It was marred and, and misshapen and unusable and disfigured. But you know what the potter did? He made it again. He, he fashioned it and formed it again. Why? How? As it seemed, another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. And, and God said to Jeremiah, you tell the nation that they're just clay in my hands. They are the clay, and I am the potter, and I can make them again. They're marred. They're disfigured. They're unusable, but I can make them another vessel. I can make them again. Why? How? Through, through what, what de is deemed good by him. As it, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel, as it seemed good to the potter to make it. That's what we are. I, I heard a sermon on that. Passes Jeremiah 18, it's probably 12 years ago that I'll never forget. And that was, that was emphasized that he made it again. That was the title of the message, he made it again. Are you letting God make you again? You are marred, you are broken, messed up, unusable, but God wants to make you another best. He wants to make you again. How does he do that? As it seems good unto him to do it. As it seems good. The circumstances that come into our lives that mold us into a Christ-like vessel that aren't always fun or pleasant for us, is just what seems good under the potter. He knows what's good. The potter knows the clay, the scripture tells us. And so this passage in Isaiah chapter 29 here is referenced by Paul in the New Testament. Uh, Paul quotes this verse here, 16 in Romans 9. He says, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Calvinists love those verses. They love to twist those verses. To, the Calvinists conclude that God blocked salvation from all the lost. He just didn't let him happen. He chose them to hell. He blocked them from receiving Christ. He chose them to hell without their involvement whatsoever. He withheld salvation from them and refused to regenerate them. And the Calvinist says, well, Romans 9 says that God's the potter, and, he, and some vessels are to honor, and some vessels are to dishonor. And so God just made these vessels saved, and he just made these vessels lost, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. That's not at all what Romans 9 says. In fact, nowhere in Romans, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is about national Israel. Israel as a nation rejecting their Messiah. And nowhere in Romans 9, 10, and 11 do you find God specifically choosing individual people to be fitted for destruction. He's, all Romans 9 tells us is that anyone who rejects Christ is part of the group of people that is fitted to destruction. Anyone who freely receives Christ will be saved. Anyone who freely refuses Christ will be destroyed. And that's all that passage says. It's not... Uh, the Israel had rejected their Messiah by and large. They still do. And, and that's what fits them to destruction. Their, their unwillingness to choose to receive Christ. But what Isaiah is doing here is exposing the absurdity and silliness of people who hide from God. He's exposing how absurd and silly it is. There are, there are vessels that are made on a potter's wheel 
Vessels made on a potter's wheel who foolishly insists that the potter was not involved. <laughs> now think about that. Here I am. I am a clay bowl. I am a clay mug. I am a clay vase or pot. And how did I get here? I, I'm very specific and intricate in my form and purpose and function. And I became this mug, this bowl, this vase, this pot. Somehow, without a potter. Here I am. Well, how did that happen? Well, slowly and gradually and by chance. Nobody made me this. I'm here to water the flowers. I'm here for you to drink out of. I was intricately and specifically formed for a purpose. And oops, I just got here without a potter making me. Nobody formed me into this. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds like today's evolutionists who say, you know, we, we weren't made by any creator. There was just energy. And then somehow the energy exploded into very minuscule pieces of matter. And then those pieces of matter grew and changed shape and form according to the laws, according to natural laws, which, by the way, we have no way to account for those either as evolutionists. But what is the origin of natural laws? We don't know. We're working on that. You read Richard Dawkins, he'll say a lot, we're working on that. Don't worry, we're working on that. They're going to be working for eternity on that because they come from God and they've already eliminated God as a possibility. Why would the thing framed say he made me not? How silly is that? The vessel of clay that was molded by the potter says, I am not, he wasn't, this guy over here, he had nothing to do with it. I am here all by myself. Why? Because of rebellion. As simple as that, because of rebellion. With admission that there is a creator, a designer, a maker, comes an obligation to submit to that designer and maker. And we're talking about people who are allergic to submission. They just will not submit. They, they would rather make a claim as silly as a vessel of clay, fresh off a potter's wheel, pointing to the potter and saying, he didn't make me, than submit. That's how silly, that's how silly they are. Hiding from the view of God is an exercise in futility. You, you, it can't be done. You can't hide from the sight view of God. Hiding from the design of God is an exercise in absurdity. The, the one is futility. This one is absurdity because you have to deny the obvious in order to do it. But many do. And they have, they're the ones with the, the stranglehold on our public schools. And it's, it's this silliness and absurdity that's being, a, that's being a, just assumed as fact. And then lastly, number three. They hide from his transformation. This is probably the longest one. <laughs> it's a long word there, sorry. So number one, they hide from his view because of their guilt. Number two, they hide from his design because of their rebellion. Lastly, number three, they hide from his transformation because of their fear. His transformation. Verse 17, is it not yet uh, very little? Is it not yet a very little while? Lebanon shall be turned to a fruitful field, and the fruitful field turned to a forest. What's that all about? Lebanon there is typical of a forest. So there's a switcheroo there. Lebanon becomes a fruitful field. Lebanon, the forest, becomes a fruitful field. The fruitful field becomes a forest. Um, the cedars of Lebanon, right? The famous place where the beautiful trees came from, uh, from Lebanon there, uh, where do trees come from? Forests. And forests are rugged. Forests are wild. Forests are scary. Forests are dangerous. Forests are... Uh, are unpredictable and dark and uncultivated and unkept. You don't want to go wandering in the forest in the middle of the night. And, and that's contrasted with a fruitful field. So you have a piece of property that's all forest, and it's wild trees and wilderness, and who knows what animals are in there, and who knows if you'll emerge alive if you go in there. And then over here, you have a, a, a piece of land that's a, that's a field. It's fruitful. It's been farmed. It's been cultivated. It's got sun. It's got water. It's organized. You've exercised dominion. You've planted and you've plowed and you know what's coming up and it's sunny and it's bright and it's it's uh fruit bearing it feeds it it, uh, it sustains so that's the contrast here what's the point israel began as a fruitful field it's to israel that the oracles of god the word of god was committed the word of god didn't come through babylon the word of god wasn't uh the first books of the bible weren't given to the persians it was through the Jews. It was through the nation of Israel. So they had the oracles of God. It was to their nation where God sent the prophets. Uh, it was to their nation that the Messiah came from. We talk about a virgin Mary of, of Jewish descent. And so they, they were the apple of God's eye, but yet they reject their Messiah. They reject Christ. They reject the prophets. They become a forest. 
They, they started off as a fruitful field, but they'll, they become a forest. And the Gentiles pull a switcheroo with them. The Gentiles who were, who were a rugged, wild wilderness and who didn't know God or were alienated from God, and many still are, but by and large, uh, many of those who would come to Christ over the next subsequent centuries would be Gentiles. We become a fruitful field. We become fruit-bearing. And so there's tr- transformative power here. Of course, Israel will one day, in a day, be saved. Israel will receive their Messiah, what's, what's left of them, and a remnant will be saved, and, and they'll be a fruitful field as well. But it's a forest transformed into a fruitful field. This, this, the rest of this passage speaks of transformation. God is able and powerful. He can open the ears of the deaf. He can open the eyes of the blind. He can turn that poor, miserable, poor, poverty-stricken person into a joyful person. He can transform. Jesus would, of course, do these things literally and physically. He gave sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. But spiritually, he does that for all of us. It's not just physically. You think of John chapter 9, maybe the most famous portion of Scripture about a blind man receiving a sight. And the man that was had his sight given to him in John chapter 9, he's, he's fixed. He's fixed physically. Great. Praise the Lord. Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies that the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind, would open the ears of the deaf. Physically, yes, but more important spiritually. And that young man in John chapter 9, great. He could see supernatural power of God, but he still wasn't saved. It's kind of, you read through John 9 and, you know, his sight, Jesus puts clay on him and he can see and he's happy about that. The Pharisees aren't happy about that. And the Pharisees come around to him and they say, hey, bub, that guy that gave you your sight, he's a sinner. And what does he say? He's like, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. Well, you can't be saved and think that your savior may be a sinner. And we know he wasn't saved because that took place later. It was a little while later when Jesus came and found him and told him, do you, who do you believe the son of God is? Do you believe the, what do you believe about the son of God? He says, I don't know who he is. And Jesus said, he that talketh with thee is he. He says, that's me. And then he believed and worshiped. He wasn't saved before that. He got saved later on. His spiritual restoration of his vision was far more important in a far more way than his physical. There's a lot of people out there that are seeking physical salvation. That's great. But what does it matter if you're, if you're lost for eternity? There's a lot of people that associate physical self. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm saved. I had that leg broken once and it got better. No, spiritual is much more important. I'd rather be blind for 100 years on this earth but be saved than burn in hell for all eternity with all the vision in the world on this side. This side's short. That side's way longer. This, your spirit lasts forever. Your soul and spirit lasts forever. We're, we're a, a, an eternal being. Many lost people have heard Christians speak glowingly of how their lives were transformed by Christ. You ever speak glowingly about how your life was transformed by Christ? You ought to. And many lost people hear about the transforming power of our Savior, but yet hide from that transforming power. Why? Why would anyone want to hide from the one who can turn the forest into the fruitful field, the one who can turn the deaf into hearing, the blind into seeing, the poor into rejoicing? Why Why stay a forest? Why stay blind? Why stay deaf? Why stay poor when you can... Be see and hear and be a fruitful field. Why stay lost? Well, they hide from his view because of their guilt. They hide from his design because of their rebellion. But they hide from his transformation because of their fear. Because of their fear. They're afraid. Change is scary. God makes us, hey, when you receive Christ and then you live for him, you're here because you're living for him, amen? And I'm glad you're here. He makes us different, doesn't he? When you live for him, he changes you. He makes you different. You're different from what you used to be. You're different from your neighbors that are lost. You're different from the world. Praise God for that, but that's scary at first. It's scary to be different. It's unfamiliar. There's fear that comes along with that. God makes us different. The prospect of being different is frightening. Familiarity is comfortable. And sin and carnality is very familiar Hence, very comfortable. However, holiness, temperance, purity, sanctification, separation, those things are unfamiliar to the sinner, aren't they? They're unfamiliar. They're not comfortable. They're scary. Even to the newly saved. Holiness, huh? What does that entail? (laughs) Purity, separation, temperance, restraint. These things are expected. 
Huh? That's unfamiliar. You mean I, I'm, ex I'm accountable to live that way? It's kind of scary. That means I'm, I'm going to have to make some changes. It's frightening. I'm going to have to live different. I'm expected to live different. It is scary. What's that going to be like? It's unfamiliar. Along with unfamiliarity comes fear. I remember when I first got saved and went through biblical discipleship classes, and I heard hard preaching that confronted the people on some of these things. And when I first started hearing what the Bible says about, about sobriety, about abstinence from certain things, about cleanness, about faithfulness, my first thought was, that's kind of scary. I'm going to change my life. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm ready to make big wholesale changes like that. I mean, those things, abstinence from certain things and sobriety and cleanness and faithfulness and decency and discipline, that sounds kind of boring. That sounds kind of hard. That certainly sounds unpopular. What if I lose my friends? What if I lose my fun? There's fear that comes along with that. It is, it is scary. And But how do you overcome fear? With faith. One of the messages that's found all throughout the Bible is faith that overcomes fear. You've got to just by faith believe that that's what God says and obey it by faith. And he'll do the transforming. And he'll take away the scary. And he'll take away the boring. And he'll take away the unpopular. And, and he'll provide all that you need to do it. Receive him by faith. Walk with him by faith. Live for him by faith. And that's how you discover that it is perfect love that casts out that fear. But to experience that perfect love, you need faith. It's living by faith that helps us live with perfect love. And that's what casts our fears out. And that's how we become transformed. When we're no longer fearful of being different. No longer fearful of the changes that God wants to bring to our lives. Knowing that he's good. Knowing that he'll provide. Knowing that he'll enable us to change into his image. He'll enable it because that's his will. And where he calls, he enables. He's so good, isn't he? Don't Let's not hide from him. Let's hide in him. That's what his word says. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, 